welcome to week four, everybody. We are wrapping up our archetypes unit by shifting our conversation from the kinds of characters you run into in just any story to the kinds of characters you run into in a myth, specifically the gods and god archetypes. Now, once we're all done taking lecture notes on this document, you'll be able to turn that in. In addition, you'll be able to take the unit two quiz based on that information, and you'll have just one additional assignment for this whole week. It'll be a pick a god assignment. Make sure you look for it in the Google Classroom. I'm not going to waste any more time. Let's go ahead and jump right in, starting with our vocabulary. Our vocab words for this unit are related. They are deity and theology. Let's jump right in with deity. A deity is a god or a spirit or a higher power. Normally, it's going to refer to a god, but there are some instances when that's not accurate. For instance, some faiths call their higher power God with a capital G, or they refer to multiple higher powers as gods with a lowercase g. Others believe in gods as well as other higher powers, and still more use terms like spirit instead of god. For example, the deities Cronus and Rhea were titans, not gods. Their children were the first generation of Greek gods. Cronus attempted to eat all of his children to prevent them from overthrowing him. Theology is the study of gods or deities, or just the study of religious beliefs in general. Those come, again, from the same root word. In Sanskrit, the word div means light or day or the sun. And from that, we get both the Latin Deus and the Greek Theos. Those both mean God. So from there, we get the term deity and theology. One thing I want you to take note of is when you're writing about gods, you'll want to make sure that you use correct capitalization. Is God capitalized or not? Well, it's easy. Just ask yourself this question. Is it a deity's name? If it is, then it's capitalized. Is it a generic term? Then don't capitalize it. So you could say, for example, the Judeo-Christian God with a capital G is similar to many Greek gods with a lowercase g. Okay, now let's move into our lecture notes. For this one, we're looking at four different kinds of gods. The Supreme Being, the Great Mother, the Dying God, and the Trickster. As you listen, just take note of the key traits of each of these kinds of gods. First up is the supreme being. Now, all of this information I'm giving you is coming directly from The World of Myth, an anthology edited by David Adams Leeming. It was the textbook for our class. So, the supreme being, as Leeming says, is the chief god who embodies the prevalent patriarchal arrangement of society, he is, in short, the embodiment of kingship, of male power, the paterfamilias. Now, the supreme being is frequently a sun god. He is the giver of life heat and light, just like the sun, and at the same time he is an unapproachable being. We see this in stories like that of Semele and Zeus, or Dante and the Light Eternal. The word deity, as I said, is derived from the Sanskrit div, meaning shine, or light, or day, so the sunlight itself is directly related to the word that we have for God. Perhaps most importantly, a supreme being is a god whose sky home becomes a metaphor for higher values and higher laws. Thus, the god is more often than not a law giver and a law preserver. We see this in stories in which a god passes down rules to his people, such as that of Yahweh or Ahura Mazda. Quick review. So, we saw that the supreme being is patriarchal, meaning a father figure. He often relates to kingship and male power structures. He's often associated with the sun, the sky, and being above others, both physically and metaphorically. And he represents higher values and is a lawgiver. Next up, let's look at the Great Mother. The Great Mother is primarily an Earth Mother, that is, she is the personification of the Earth itself. With the Earth Mother, we associate the ideas of things that come out of the Earth, of nourishment and creation. There is a connection to the Great Mother with an equal or dominant mate, usually a representation of the sky or heaven. Heaven and Earth then become the primal couple, united in the act of creation. So, 
This is, in other words, the female power to counterbalance the male power. Typically, the sky god falls in love with the earth goddess, or vice versa. We see this in examples of Papa Rangi, in Sky Man and Earth Woman, and in the Egyptian Geb and Nut. In the stories of the great goddess or the great mother, a pattern emerges in which this figure mourns the loss of a loved one, goes on a search, and brings about some form of resurrection. One easy example of that would be the story of Demeter and her daughter Persephone. Persephone goes down into the world of Hades, and during that time, Demeter, this goddess associated with the earth, stops allowing plants to grow, and so we have winter. When her daughter returns to her, those plants grow again, and we can have the spring and then the summer. These stories are concerned with death, but also with planting, with sexuality, and with reincarnation, both physical as well as spiritual renewals. All right, quick review. We learned that the Great Mother is associated with earth, with nourishment, and with creation. She represents female power, balanced by the male power, and often experiences loss, but then resurrection and renewal. Next up, we'll get into that dying god archetype. Now, this is frequently the figure that died in the story of the Great Mother. The god king dies, and he is in some sense revived, if not actually brought back to the living world. Traditionally, scholars have associated this pattern with the cycle of vegetation, so you'll often see dying god figures hanged on or otherwise associated with a tree or other forms of vegetation. The dying god's descent into death can be seen as a metaphor for the psychological descent into the subconscious. It can suggest psychic, spiritual, or emotional rebirth, or the lack of it. In other words, you're not really dying, but a part of you is dying so that you can be reborn. It's sort of like allowing the part of you that was a middle schooler to go so that the part of you who is a high schooler can flourish, allowing the part of you that is a high schooler to go so that the part of you who is an adult can flourish. So it's not a literal death, but the death of some part of you so that you can be spiritually or emotionally renewed. The dying god, finally, is also a scapegoat, one who dies for the greater good of society. They often take on the burden of their society's shortcomings or sins, we see this in gods like Jesus and Attis, Osiris and Dionysus. So to review, this god dies and is brought back in some way, and they are associated then with vegetation, just like the cycles of crops dying each year and coming back again the next season. It can be seen as a metaphor for emotional and spiritual rebirth, and as sacrificing for the greater good, or rather dying so that others' guilt can be erased. Our final god archetype is the trickster god. The trickster is at once wise and foolish, the perpetrator of tricks and the butt of his or her own jokes. He is often promiscuous and amoral. Amoral doesn't mean evil, it means neither good nor bad. He is outrageous in his actions, and yet the trickster is also profoundly inventive, creative by nature, and in some ways a helper to humanity. He emphasizes the lower bodily functions. He often takes an animal form. The trickster then speaks to our animal nature, to our physical as opposed to our spiritual side. This makes the trickster god a counterpart to the supreme being. If the supreme being is above all other gods, if the supreme being is the most spiritually high, then the trickster god rejects that and instead makes themselves base and animalistic. All right. One more review. They are wise and foolish at once. They are amoral, meaning neither good nor evil, but they help humanity in some way. They also emphasize the base bodily needs over spirituality. And that's it for the Archetypes Unit. Make sure you turn in your lecture notes and make sure that you do the quiz based on that information. And of course, make sure you check that Google Classroom for anything else that you've missed, including this week's Pick a God assignment. If you need any help, as always, swing by and visit me during office hours or shoot me an email. Until next time, take care. <laughs>